Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, and we will read verses 7 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Let's read God's Word. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. All of God's people say, Amen. Okay. Well, as you can see on the screen behind me, today will be part three, uh, where we have been studying ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. And we want to understand the biblical portrait of the biblical church. And if you were with us in the prior teachings of this series, you'll recall that we started out by discussing who the head of the church is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the sovereign ruler of of his church because he is the merciful redeemer of his church jesus christ rules and reigns as the sovereign head of his church i'm not the head of this church you're not the head of this church the pope is not the head of the church so-called saints and angels are not the head of the church. Nobody is the head of the church except the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the head, if you recall, we saw how the Lord commands us through his word, as to how he wants his church to function. We saw, number one, that the church is to go deep. To go deep in the study of the Word. Deep, sound doctrine. All Scripture is inspired by God. Therefore, we need to study deeply all of Scripture so that we can know more and more who God is, how God is, so that we can know more and more how we are to live in honor and reverence of God, how we are to function as a church under the authority of Christ, and we go deep in the Word so that, as we saw last week, we can go high in reverent, dignified, holy worship of God. Deep in the Word, high in worship. We do not want to worship God in a way that maybe we think we should? Or in a way that maybe others tell us how we should? No, 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 no. 
we do not want to contaminate worship by bringing in man's ideas and man's methods. That's why we go deep in the word. That's my responsibility as a pastor to take God's flock as deep as we can go in the word. All of the word because all the word all of scripture is inspired by God. We go deep in the word so that we can then go high in reverent holy worship. You can't worship God unless you know God. And how is it you know God? Through the Word of God. And this isn't something that I or the elders or some denomination has come up with. This is from the head of the church, Jesus Christ. He has given to his church pastor teachers. Why? To take the flock deep in the Word so that we can worship God in spirit and in truth, where we go high in dignified, reverent worship. Because we don't want to have, as we saw last week, an Uza outbreak <laughs> in the church, right? So, deep in the word, high in worship. But what about when it comes to our relationship with the people of God in the church? Well, it's real simple. We're going to see that today. We are to go outward in our fellowship, in our love, listen, for one another in the body. In fact, in our text for today, if you would like to underline the words, one another. In verse 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Who's he talking to here? Believers. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another. Who's he talking about? Believers in the body. Verse 10, as each one, talking about as each Christian, has received a special gift, spiritual gift, he or she is to employ it in serving one another. Are you getting the idea? Biblical portrait of the biblical church. We go deep in the word, we go high in worship, and we go outward in loving one anothering fellowship. We don't ignore the lost, and we'll see that in a few moments. But just like my job as a pastor, first and foremost, is to feed the believers. Just like as we as believers collectively are to corporately go high in reverent worship, we are also to love and serve, ready, one another. And this is what Peter was saying to the Christians back then. Verse 7, he says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, verse 8, keep fervent in your love for whom? For one another. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Certainly God's love in Christ, that covers a multitude of sins, but also as believers. When we are fervent in our love for one another, eh, we're going to get rid of that bitterness, that anger, that arrogance, that hostility. And it covers over a lot of sins, doesn't it? Again, that's why we go deep in the Word. 
So we can show love first and foremost to God, where we love him with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then we show love to one another, fervent love for one another, where there's not jealousy, there's not envy, there's not fighting and factions. And this is so important that we care for one another. The context back then, Peter was writing to believers. Go to chapter one, real quick, the introduction of this letter. Verses one and two, Peter introduces himself as the writer of this letter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, who is he writing to? To those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, those who are chosen, the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest, 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 in the fullest me measure. Who was Peter writing to? He was writing to, he describes them as aliens. People ask me all the time, Andrew, are there aliens in the Bible? Sure they are. You see, you see an example of aliens right here. Who are the aliens? Believers, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is not our home. And as believers, we are to be counter culture. The non-believing world is to look at us and go, Look at these people and look at us as though we're aliens because we are. We love the Lord because he loved us first. We worship the Lord because he is worthy of all worship and praise. We love to study his word deeply. We love to care for one another. Why? Because we as believers are all we've got here on earth. Now, yes, God, the Holy Spirit lives in us. Yes, we have the word. Yes, we have the church. But listen, we're aliens. This is not our home. We're simply passing through. We're going to glory. But in the meantime, here on earth, we need one another. The believers back then, you know why? Again, verse 1, he describes them as aliens who are scattered. They were dealing with massive persecution. The Emperor Nero, in July of 64 AD, set Rome on fire. Now, there are various different opinions as to why Nero had done this. Uh, in all likelihood, Nero wanted to clear some land where he could build a glorious castle or palace for himself. And therefore, he ended up <laughs> burning down a large portion of Rome to clear some land for himself. Well, Nero did not anticipate that his plan would backfire, that the Roman citizens would be upset with Nero for doing this. And therefore, Nero, in panic, decided to find somebody else to blame. And who did he find? Christians. And it was then starting in July of 64 AD, all the way to Nero's death in 68 AD. It was during that period, a period, by the way, in which Peter was writing, it was during that period that Christians were extreme, experiencing extreme persecution from the Nero. Nero, we're told, church history tells us, you know, would invite guests to his big palace and 
He had this long kind of like garden driveway where guests would walk. And in order to light that garden driveway, Nero put crosses on both sides. And Christians were hung on those crosses. And they were set aflame. And so as the guests were coming, they had plenty of light. As they watched Christians hanging on crosses, being burned to death. And as a result of this persecution, many believers were scattered. They were trying to survive. In fact, just hop over to chapter 4, right after our text that we'll be taking a look at in a few moments. Look at verse 12. Peter said to the believers, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exaltation. Do you see it? Peter was writing to persecuted, scattered believers. And they were dealing with some extreme fiery ordeals. And that's why our text, back to verse 7, Peter said to them, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sober judgment, or sound judgment, and sober spirit for the purpose of playing around in the world? No! For the purpose of prayer! Above all, verse 8, Keep fervent in your love for one another. They were all that, that they had. Keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Boy, I tell you something. Persecution has a way of purifying the church. Persecution has a way of uniting the church. And persecution has a way of keeping the church from jealousies and envy and arguments and petty this and that. Why? Because when you realize, Christian, that you and your brothers in the body are all you've got, you're not going to sin against them. Or better yet, you're going to think long and hard before you decide to, right? Love covers over a multitude of sins, potential sins, right? And then he went on to say, verse 9, be hospitable to whom? One another, without complaint. Again, think about what was happening in the culture. The culture was trying to kill Christians. Be fervent in your love for one another, church. Be hospitable to one another, church. Verse 10, as each one, each believer, has received a special gift, a unique combination of spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit to each believer. As each believer has received the spiritual gift, employ it in serving one another. Praying for each other, serving each other, loving each other, sharing God's truth with one another. Helping one another, being hospitable to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, like I'm doing right now, is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things, whether you're speaking or serving, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever 
Amen. And why is it so important for the church to not only go deep in the word and high in worship, but to also go outward in loving one anothering, fellowship with one another? Why is it so important? Verse 12, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Look, I can do that if my brothers and sisters in the church are reminding me of the immense privilege I have of being in Christ and not in the world anymore. You see why we need one another? But to the degree, verse 13, that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exaltation. Cannot wait until Christ returns. Verse 14, if you, Christian, are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Boy, what a great reminder, right? That's why we need one another. Verse 15, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Do you see why? We are to be outward in our fellowship and one anothering. We need each other. This is what Peter was saying to those persecuted and scattered believers. We are aliens, Christian. This is not our home. We're passing through. And we need to be passing through with one another so that as we deal with the inevitable fiery ordeals from the world, the world which hates Christ and hates followers of Christ, as we are passing through and dealing with inevitable persecution, we have our brothers and sisters with us to strengthen us, to encourage us, to love us, to be hospitable to us, to share God's truth with us, to pick us up when we fall, and to protect us from compromise in order to save our skin. Do you see what Peter was saying here to the believers? And again, do you notice how many times he used the phrase, one another? Who's he talking to? Believers in the body who were dealing with persecution. But isn't this the same thing Jesus had said? Go to John 15. Again, notice one another. John 15, in the upper room. Jesus was with the eleven. He had already dismissed Judas to begin the betrayal. Peter was present, and he heard these words from his Lord. John 15, verse 17, This I command you, that you love one another. Why? Look at verse 18. Jesus said, The world hates you? <laughs> know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, Christian, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, how is that? Jesus said, I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. Do you see why up in verse 17, Jesus said, love one another? And again, Peter was present when our Lord said that. And therefore, in 1 Peter, he was simply repeating the words of our Lord, that which he had learned, that we are to love one another, especially 
as the world gets more and more hostile. in its attitude towards Christ and Christians, right? And boy, I think you will agree. Over the last, what, 10, 15 years? Think about how that hostility has risen. Well, it's not gonna get better. Uh, not until we're in glory, of course. That's why we are to love one another. And again, you think about it, as we go deeper in the Word, not only is our love inflamed more and more or ignited more and more towards our God, our love also is ignited towards one another. Now, some of you may say, well, wait a second, Andrew, what about evangelism? Was Jesus against evangelism? Of course not. Just hop over to chapter 13. Great question. Um, Jesus actually does talk about evangelism here. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Again, still in the upper room. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Who is the to you? He's talking to the 11, right? A new commandment I give to you that you love. Here it is again. One another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Outward fellowship in the body of Christ. What about evangelism? Look at verse 35. Jesus said, by this, are one anothering of each other? By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. Do you see it? The non-believing world desperately is looking for love. Is desperately looking for healthy, safe, respectful fellowship. You don't believe me? Just look at all the bars. Look at all the clubs. Look at all the various different pagan groups. Think about what's happening on social media. People are looking to be loved. And Jesus here says, as we love each other in the body, the non-believing world looks at our love and they may not agree with our message but they cannot deny the incredible love they see that we have for one another and who knows how the Holy Spirit will use that to draw them to you Christian so then you have the opportunity to, to declare the truth about Christ so they can experience true agape love through Jesus Christ, his Savior. Just like my first focus as a pastor is the body of Christ, as believers in the body, your first focus obviously is high and reverent worship towards God, but also loving one another and towards each other. And again, when non-believers then come into the church and they see how we, we treat each other, how we love each other, how we serve each other, guys, that's gonna have an impact on them, or it should, right? Because they cannot see that type of love anywhere else. Or if there's any so-called so superficial love that maybe they've experienced, in all likelihood, that type of superficial love uh, includes alcohol, drugs, pornography, you name it, right? But when they see our love, our love first and foremost towards our triune God, and then our love towards the redeemed of God, Jesus said, by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love 
for one another. Biblical portrait of the biblical church, deep in the word, high in reverent and holy worship, outward in loving one another in fellowship, right? In fact, just hop over to Galatians chapter 6. Again, Paul says the same thing. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He's talking to the church, or churches, I should say, in the area there of Galatia, in the Roman province of Galatia. Verse 9, he says, Let us, talking to believers, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap a harvest if we don't grow weary. I think this is a great verse for evangelism. We just keep sowing the seed of the gospel of Christ. Don't give up. It's not up to us to save anybody. We can't save anybody. But we are responsible to faithfully and obediently sow the seed of truth, right? Well, again, verse 9 says, let's not grow weary in this. Let's not lose heart. In due time, we'll reap if we don't grow weary. But then look at verse 10. He says, so then, while we have opportunity, Christian." Let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith, the body. So how has your one anothering been as of late? Have you been praying for and with your brothers and sisters in the church? Have you been sending them encouraging emails or, or text messages? Have you called them to ask how they're doing or maybe to say, hey, I haven't seen you at church for a couple weeks. Is everything okay? Can I help you? Have you made a meal for somebody? delivered it to them or maybe call up a restaurant and DoorDash and let them deliver it <laughs> have you been involved in one another again so often in the modern church you 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 see this this kind of charge coming from the pulpits where somebody comes into the church, non-believer, they make a profession of faith. <laughs> very often it's very spurious, but they make a profession of faith and suddenly they're told now they need to march out into the world and tell others about Christ. Yes, we are to share the gospel of Christ. He is the only Savior, the only Redeemer, and the only name by which people can be saved. Absolutely, we share the gospel of Christ. But think of that baby believer, assuming that person truly is saved, suddenly is sent out into the world. That young believer is not spiritually mature. That young believer is at high risk of falling into compromise with the world. That's why we gather as the Lord's people on the Lord's day in the Lord's house and we go deep in the word. We go high in corporate reverent worship and we go outward in loving one another in fellowship so that together we continue to support each other throughout the week when you all are out there in the world, especially when it comes to a baby believer. We don't want them to go out there and get slaughtered. We don't want them to go out there and misrepresent Christ. That's why we need each other. Peter said it. Keep fervent in your love for one another. Be hospitable to one another. 
Humbly serve one another with the spiritual gifts you've been given. Jesus said the same thing, right? Love one another, love one another, love one another. By this, all men will know that you're really my disciples. Paul here in Galatians, same thing. Yes, we want to sow the seed of the gospel to as many non-believers as we can, but we need to focus on taking care of our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. The church Christian is your family. The world is your mission field. But be careful because the world hates Christ and the world will do anything and everything to try to stop the gospel of Christ so when you're out there in the world Christian you need to make sure that you have on the full armor of God right that's why as a pastor teacher I am commanded by the head of the church to take you deep in the word so that first and foremost we can go high in reverent holy worship and then outward loving one another in fellowship so that when we scatter and are out there during the week amongst our family members there are places of employment and restaurants and out in the community we've got to make sure that we're strong in the word so that we can properly represent our Redeemer to a decaying and dark world. We need each other, right? That's why Ephesians chapter 5, again Paul, it says in verse 15, Therefore, writing to the church in Ephesus, be careful how you walk or live as a believer, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command. And by the way, it's continuous. Be filled. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. And the result will be, verse 19, you then speak to one another. Do you see it again? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's your outward fellowship to your brothers and sisters in Christ. But you also sing and make melody with your heart to the Lord. That's your high and reverent worship of Christ. Verse 20, you're always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. That again is your high and reverent worship to the Lord. And verse 21, and you are subject to one another. That's your outward one anothering in fellowship in fear and reverence of Christ. Do you see it? And so, as the church does what she's supposed to do, not according to my standards, but according to the standards of the head of the church, Jesus Christ, well, guess what? As we go deep in the Word, guess what? You're filled with the Spirit you're then able to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to Him. Worshiping Him. But also as you're filled with the Spirit, look at your love towards one another. You're singing and making melody, music, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. In other words, you're edifying each other. You're involved in God talk with each other. You're willing to be in submission to one another, to bring glory to Christ. You're willing to serve. You're willing to humble yourself. You're willing to, to care about others. See what happens when you're filled with the Spirit? And oh, by the way, 
How am I certain that you're filled with the Spirit by having God's Word deeply in you? Go to Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 16. Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Wait a second, Andrew. I don't see that there. It just simply says, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. You're right. But look at the results when the Word of Christ richly dwells within you. The same exact results that we see in Ephesians 5. Being filled with the Spirit. With all wisdom, you're teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Do you see it? Just like Ephesians 5? With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God, whatever you do in word or deed, you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. There's being filled with the Spirit. The Word of Christ richly dwelling within you. That's why we go deep in the Word so that you can worship God in a way that He commands us to worship Him and so that you can love one another the way He commands us to. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And we need to be doing that all the time. Again, that's why when we gather, we're doing that. And then when we scatter, we want to stay filled. That's why we have all our Bible studies during the week. But we also realize you still have to be out in the world. And so we want to strengthen you as much as we can so that you can represent your Redeemer to them, right? And so we understand biblical portrait of the biblical church. And these are only a couple points. As we continue this series over the next year, year and a half, um, we'll add more points to this. But I just wanted to give you these as we've gone through our first three parts of this series. Christ is the head. He commands us to go deep in His Word, to go high in reverent, dignified worship, and outward in loving fellowship in one another. Make sense? Okay. Now, what about Zoom? <laughs> what about attending church on Zoom? Look, Zoom has its benefits, especially as we were going through the COVID pandemic. It allowed us to continue to go deep in the Word, to worship our Lord, and as best as we could, try to fellowship with each other on Zoom. So Zoom had served a necessary purpose, an emergency purpose for a time. But what about Zoom now? Well, let's kind of just go through this real quick as I conclude. On Zoom, are you able to go deep in the Word? Yes. Now, I think that Probably it's easier for you while you're on Zoom at home by yourself to get distracted, right? Dog is barking, somebody comes knocking at the door, maybe you've got some family members that are running around. Maybe you are not dressed for success while you're at home on Zoom, where you come really prepared to study the Word. Maybe on Zoom you kind of just slide in the last second. You turn off your picture because you're not really dressed appropriately. I'm not saying you're dressed, you know, in some sort of irreverent, sensual way, but maybe you're in pajamas, <laughs> right? But I'm attending church. Can you go deep in the Word? Yeah, I think so. But I think you'll agree that it's a lot easier to get distracted as compared to when you gather with your brothers and sisters in the church. Now, certainly, we can get distracted when people are together, but I think there's something very special when the redeemed of the Lord come together in the house of the Lord and together study the Word of the Lord, right? So, Zoom. Can you go deep in the Word? Yeah, 
Let's go to the next one. How about high and reverent worship? Now the noose is tightening, isn't it? Yes, you can be on your computer or on your phone and you can be singing just like we are live. But it's not the same when you're by yourself. It's not the same when you're absent from one another as together the body is corporately worshiping the Lord. It's not the same. I know that many, once we started back with church live, and I know how many said, man, I miss this. Just being together and hearing everybody open the Bible together, or the pages of the scripture, just as we're going back and forth. And they said, wow, just to hear the voices of the redeemed together, just us singing the hallelujah chorus, there's nothing better. And people miss that. And some of you, if you're still trying to do church on Zoom, you're missing that. Again, can you go deep in the Word? Yeah, you can listen to the Word taught. Can you go high in worship? I, I think so. But as you're kind of just slumping in the couch, as your feet are up, as you're getting distracted by text messages and tell me about the third one on Zoom. Can you one another? No. Not only are you missing being one anothered, the body is missing you because you're not one anothering others. Do you see it? Look, if you're sick, of course, sign on Zoom for a church service. It's better than the alternative of not hearing the word or worshiping, right? So if you're sick, it's okay to go on Zoom. Or if you're um, you know, unable to leave your home. We've got some people in our congregation who are unable to leave their home because of severe physical afflictions. Well, of course it's okay for them to be on Zoom. Again, it's better than the alternative, right? And I make sure to, make, to go during the week to visit those people. I know people in our congregation, we do that so that they are feeling one another, right? So Zoom is okay, again, if you're sick, um, if you're housebound and you can never leave. Again, there are still some people who are very concerned about COVID. Now the new thing down here is monkeypox and so forth. Look, if that's something that you're extremely nervous about, okay, come on Zoom. If you're on vacation, you want to plug into Zoom, again, it's better than the alternative, not celebrating your Lord on the Lord's Day, right? So it's okay, but for most of us, we don't want to get in the habit of redefining church or doing church our own way, right? Because who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. And he clearly commands that we go deep in his word together with one another. He clearly commands that we go high in reverent, dignified worship with one another. And he clearly commands that we are to love one another in healthy, edifying fellowship. The church needs you, you need your church. And so again, this is not meant to be a rebuke to anybody, but I want you to really think about this as we're studying the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. We wanna 
function as a church the way the Lord wants us to, right? Not the way we want to or somebody else tells us to. And so think about how you, as a member of the church, are functioning according to the head of the church. Go to Ephesians 5 and I'll conclude here. Starting in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. I'm commanded to love my wife the way Christ loved his church. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show that perfect love to my wife. But that's my goal. And I don't have any room to complain or to try to find an out on this. Because Paul here says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that I am to love my wife just as Christ loved the church. How much did he love the church? He gave himself up for her. 2,000 years ago, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man, not only lived a perfect life, fulfilling the law perfectly for us in our place, but the righteous Redeemer went up on a cross And it was there that the sins of the church, the elect, Christ's sheep, that the sins of the church, the sins of the bride of Christ were placed on him. And then God's holy, righteous, and just wrath was poured out on Christ instead of on the bride. Christ declared, paid in full for whom? His church, the redeemed. He died, but three days later he rose in victory, overcoming sin and death for whom? The elect, his sheep, his bride, the church. And Christian, you have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You were outside the family of God. You were in the family of the devil, but you have been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. You have been chosen out of the world, chosen out of Satan's family. You have been adopted into the family of God. You've been placed into the body of Christ. You are a child of God. You are redeemed of Christ, and you have the unspeakable privilege to go deep in the Word with your brothers and sisters, to go high in worship with your brothers and sisters, and to go outward in loving fellowship towards your brothers and sisters. You're not going to do that staring at a computer or your iPhone. Again, Zoom has its benefits. But Christian, your most exciting day should be the Lord's Day, where you wake up early and you pray and you sing and you prepare and you dress and you want to make sure that, that you get to church on time where you can spend time with the people of the Lord prior to service, during the service, and after service, and then go out and represent your Redeemer. Think about how much Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. On that day, when we're in glory, 
And so are you 100% certain that first and foremost, you have been redeemed by Christ? Have you truly repented of your sins? Have you truly placed your faith and trust in Christ alone to be your Savior? Have you cried out for His mercy, His grace, recognizing you can't save yourself? And rejoicing in the fact that Christ paid for your sins in full in terms of that day of judgment. Have you cried out to Jesus? Have you trusted in Him? If so, guess what? You're in the body of Christ. Go deep in His work. Go high in worship. Go outward in loving fellowship and do it with your brothers and sisters in Christ. For Christ so loved His church that He gave Himself up for her. Christian, your church is your family. Love one another. So that by this, Jesus said, all people will know that you're really His disciple. Amen.